Welcome to Voices, a podcast from the Institute for Human Rights and Business. Here, we're seeking to elevate the range of perspectives on the role of business in the world and in people's everyday lives. Hello, everybody. My name is Salil Tripathi, and I work with the Institute for Human Rights and Business. We are here today to remember nine Ogoni names. Ken Saroviva, Barinem Kyobel, Saturday Dobi, Ol Labura, Nodu Eavo, Felix Noate, Daniel Gaboku, John Kapunen, and Bari Borbera. These nine individuals were wrongly accused of being involved in the deaths of four Ogoni chiefs and jailed in, the Niger- in, in Nigeria, in the Niger Delta in the early 1990s. The trial against them was considered a sham by major international human rights organizations. The Ogoni people were struggling against uh, and campaigning against the exploitation of oil from their land by oil companies, many of them, but primarily Shell. And they were found guilty by, on these charges by a Nigerian court. Death sentence was pronounced on them. The US president at the time was Bill Clinton. The British prime minister was John Major. They all interceded, tried to get the verdict overturned. They failed. And on 10th of November, 1995, the executions were carried out. It led to Nigeria being removed from the Commonwealth for a while. It led to transformative changes in politics later in Nigeria. Most importantly, it changed the way we look at business and human rights. During the trial, these were the words that Ken had said. I and my colleagues are not the only ones on trial. The company has ducked this trial, but this day will surely come. The ecological war that the company has waged in the Delta will be called into question and the crimes will be duly punished. Strong words. Ken was a writer. He was also, as Nimmo Basi told us earlier, a businessman, a thinker, a leader, and a human rights defender. Today, I have panelists with me to speak about uh, his legacy, but from the perspective of what happened in Nigeria, the view from the ground. We have No Saroviva, Ken's daughter, a distinguished writer who lives in London, joins us from London to tell us about the impact. We have Ledam Miti, distinguished human rights lawyer who knew Ken. He had been in prison with Ken in jail and he played a major role in bringing the Ken, keeping the Ken legacy alive and fighting uh, for the Ogoni people. And we have Austin Onoha who has worked tirelessly on corporate social responsibility in Africa. And uh, my first trip to Niger Delta was in 2003 and I've been there two or three times since. And Ledam and Austin taught me about what, what questions to ask, what to listen, what to hear, and what to learn from what was going on there. Thank you very much for joining us. No, you're joining us from London. Tell us about your father as a person, as a leader, as the impact that he has had. My father was uh, an extraordinary person. He started off with such humble beginnings, but he was never intimidated. Uh, He went to the best school uh, in uh, Southern Nigeria. And from there, he went on to Baden University uh, as an Ogoni man. He was an ethnic minority, a tiny ethnic minority, but was often looked down upon in the Niger Delta. So he had a a sort of uphill struggle within Nigeria. And the fact that he was able to put Ogoni on the map is quite incredible. When I was a child and you told people that you were from the Ogoni ethnic group, they didn't know who we were. I'm talking about other Nigerians. Um, So, you know, my father, he was a very ambitious man. He was a huge lover of arts, culture, science, and um, he really wanted the rest of Ogoni to rise up with him. So, you know, he was, um, in his younger days, he was a commissioner for education and he worked hard to, to, you know, get my uh, Ogoni people um, into education because he ultimately wanted us to take um, control of our own destiny and he knew that education was the, the way to do that and um, you know so he not only did he pay for his uh, his siblings and his uh, 
his children's education, but he paid for the education of you know a lot of other people within Ogoni. So you know he was big on uh, you know sacrifice, lifting up other people, and he was fearless. Uh, he knew the risks in taking on a multinational as big as Shell and a military dictatorship as ruthless as Sani Abacha's, but he wasn't cowed by the challenge. You know, he rose up to it. And, you know, he's energized uh, the, the Niger Delta now and given people, A, a sense of, uh, you know, injustice, which perhaps wasn't there before. Um, you know, a lot of people accepted the oil spills and the environmental degradation and never really believed that they could do anything about it. But uh, my father gave them that, that courage and you know, helped them understand that they were being taken advantage of. And you know, that's been a huge legacy for him. Uh, no longer can oil companies uh, take advantage of us in, to quite the extent that they did in, in, in the past. People have had to listen when Ogoni speak. Uh, and that's a huge, huge legacy that, that my father left. Right. Uh, um, Ledham, I wanted to ask you about, uh, because you knew him so well, tell us about the trial itself and the outcome. And, you know, we are talking about 25 years since, and there are lots of people who are captivated by the Nigerian story, but had no knowledge of the struggle itself. They are probably, they were not even born, some of them, when the whole, uh, whole um, struggle took place. So if you can briefly recount us the story itself and the impact. Well, as um, I grew up first from a community uh, where oil um, was in abundance, my village, sits on about 70% of Ogoni's oil reserves. So I grew up as a child to start seeing what oil exploitation and its devastating effects were. I can say that as a child, we were made to drink crude oil because they told us it was uh, medicinal. Uh, so when the struggle um, started. Um, I, I joined because I knew it firsthand how, what it was. And eventually we were all hoarded up and put into prison in such circumstances that was quite demonizing. I can tell you that the first time we were kept in that detention, you only had a space to stand or to squat. Um, so if you want to sleep, someone had to put the legs astride and you had to lie in between them because organists were being brought in in their hordes. During the trial, what happened is that we were put down there and it was almost like nine months after that they now thought of the charges that they were trying to now bring against us and shopping for witnesses that they were going to parade against us. Uh, what the Nigerian government did then, or the Nigerian regime, I rather prefer to call them that, uh, was to take the whole trial away from the normal trial and now set up a military tribunal exclusively with its own rules that deviated from the norm and from the legal rules and now, decided, and now decided that this is where we are going to be tried. Where the whole burden was put on us, the accused persons, to, to, to show why we were not there. And the whole story or the concept of the prosecution, as it were, was just to say that because certain things happened in Ugoni and we were the leaders of Mosul, then we were now vicariously liable for the, the, the events that took place that led to the death, sadly, of um, uh, the, the, the four prominent Ugoni chiefs. Um, incidentally, the pains of it is that you pitched Ken there as being accused of uh, murdering his in-laws. Because like the, the Oragis, 
the Oranga is married to the elder sister of Ken's wife. And then the late Chief Kobani is my maternal uncle. So you pitched that I was involved in maybe murdering my maternal uncle. And that's how the whole sham of a trial went. And all true, it went in such manner that you knew that there was a predetermined result that was going to come out. Um, what was there? I mean, Ken didn't lose sight of this bit one all true. And in fact, uh, I recall because one of the things that people do not know about him is the man's large arsenal of humor. I remember on one occasion where he, he sat down there and the tribunal chairman was like, will you stand up? So he didn't hear, he sat down for a while and then the man said, the, the chairman said, I think, did you hear me? And, and he retorted that he was, he was actually sick that what he was seeing, he couldn't see the judges there. What he saw were some kangaroos jumping on each other. And, and, and so that was the sort of trial we were being subjected to. Um, suborn witnesses were brought who later confessed that they were bribed to, um, to tell the stories that they were telling against us. And Sitting down now, looking back 25 years, I'm pained about the loss which the Ogoni suffered, not only in terms of the Ogoni 9, but also in terms of the Ogoni 4 and several others that were killed in such circumstances. I feel pained because how do you, the other day, just this year, I'm sitting down in my office, and one of those um, suborn witnesses whose testimony were relied on to convict all these people walked up to my office and said he came to apologize to me for what role he played. And I said, you don't need to apologize to me because at least I'm alive. You need to, the families of those whose your false testimony helped people who wanted to kill them to kill. So. That is the sort of trial we are talking about. And um, both under Nigerian law as a lawyer, because I defended myself during that, that trial, which was our own strategy of trying to, because at this stage, the mental torture involved in the fact that you were denied access to any read, read, reading material, even the Bible, were not allowed us. And Ken couldn't stay without at least reading, reading something. So we say, okay, I will defend myself so that we can get some books into the cell. And two, there was limit to what you can brief, I mean, some other lawyer that we didn't have access to. But while I'm there, I was, I had the knowledge I could be able to, I mean, uh, during cross-examination to I mean, expose some of the lies that were there. That was a strategy that we, we adopted at that time. So um, it's something that you wouldn't want to wish that it will happen. I look back today, we pay to, to remember, I mean, that as I said, there's no family in Ukuri that cannot show you the scar of this trouble. Um, anytime it comes to this part time of the year, I'm a little bit nervous because I say this is when I should be dead. I could have been dead. Uh, my daughter is, uh, was born while I was in that detention. So I couldn't have seen, if I died, I couldn't have seen my daughter. So mm -hmm. these are all reminders of what the Ogonis have passed through. And, um, and, 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 and all the thing that carries some of us continuously in this is that you want that to do the bit you can that these lives were not lost in vain. And if you ask me, that is that has been the motivation of uh, why some of us were hanging on. Yeah, no, absolutely. The, it should never be in vain, yeah. Austin, you have worked in the Niger Delta to reclaim some of the dignity and respect for the communities. And you've taken me to some pretty inaccessible places in Niger Delta. I remember our travels together in on this 
in the creeks and so on. Um, tell us about your work and tell us about the legacy that you see in the Delta of the Ogoni struggle. Thank you, Salil. It's uh, good to see you. It's also good to see Ledum again. I, we shared a taxi from Abuja Airport I think four or five years ago when we couldn't fly. And uh, during that trip, I told him that um, we're still waiting for his book because the experience he had uh, ought to be written down. And Ledum promised me he was going to do something about it. I've not had anything. So I'm still waiting <laughs> to... We are all uh, waiting, Ledum. <laughs> So, I'm, I'm right on it, is that it's his history keeps on going and you are looking at where to draw the line. Yeah. Good, good. Um, you know, I, I've been teaching at the West African Peace Building Institute in Accra, Ghana. I teach uh, non-violence and peace education. I also teach um, natural resources management, uh, natural resources governance and conflict management. And, one of the frameworks I've used is to try and structure these two courses around the Ogoni struggle. For instance, when I talk about nonviolence and peace education, I try to use Ken and his colleagues and Gladum and Co, how they were uh, nonviolent and the result. And on one occasion, a young man from the Niger Delta, precisely from River State, asked me a question. He said, Austin, you are telling us about nonviolence and peace education. Ken and Co decided to be nonviolent. What was the result? I, I told him they died or rather they were killed or they were murdered, but that does not remove from the quality of the nonviolent struggle with them back to it, it, rather, it reinforces it, it strengthens it, because many people have walked through this art, lived their life, made all the money and name, but they left on song. But here we are. I think, uh, I don't know whether Salil was there at the 10th anniversary. I was in Geneva. I spoke. This is the 25th. I've also been invited to talk. And every day of our lives, we talk about Ken. But you see, um, my bachelor's is in history. And I reflect on these things. And one of the things that has struck me is under the military, and Ledum alluded to it a few seconds ago, they had, quote and unquote, the mind to stage a trial. But under a democracy, we don't even have the mind to stage a trial. We shot at our young people at the Lakey Toll Plaza. So, when you put that within the context of Nigeria, you ask yourself, are we making progress or we are retrogressing in the way we value and treat our people? Today, I don't have all the evidence, but I think that the voluntary principles on security and human rights is not unconnected with the death of Ken and his colleagues. It, it must have been an impetus for it. So, and in many communities in Niger Delta that I've worked on, currently I'm the lead facilitator for the multi-stakeholder platform for the peaceful coexistence of Ishekiris and Ejoz in Delta states. I'm also on the board of Partners for Peace. One of the things we have learned from, you know, all this is that Communities can ask the right questions. You can no longer wake up and say this community was violent or they did A or they did B. The government, the companies are getting embarrassed with the kind of questions that communities are asking. Because communities are saying, fine, if you are exploring or exploiting oil in our place, what are the mechanisms you've put in place to ameliorate the consequences for us, for instance? If you spill oil in our place, how do you want to go about the cleanup? 
how do you want to ensure that we get jobs because we can no longer have access to our farms and our rivers? So those questions are being asked. And unfortunately, unfortunately, 25 years down the line, we are not providing the kind of answers that the communities need. Yes, quite a number of initiatives have come on board. And I think we're gonna, even the amnesty program, the technical committee, which Ledum headed, they are all connected to what happened to Ledum, Ken and their colleagues. And the issue is gradually we are inching towards uh, what they call the end of oil. Let's put it that way. Now, what is the program that the government is putting in place to address the consequences of oil when it's no longer there? Because government remains the primary provider of development. And if that is the situation, they owe everybody, whether oil producing or non oil producing, a responsibility to develop those environments. Are we seeing anything in that line? That, that, that's one aspect, and we need to. And it's unfortunate, and I don't know whether this is the right place to say it. Oil has become Nigeria, and Nigeria has become oil. Mm. I mean, it's surprising that the current president has remained the minister for petroleum. Mm. For the first four years of his administration and for the next four years, he's going to remain the minister. And the question we ask is why? Mm. Is it because of the strategic importance of oil or because he wants to use our revenue to develop the area that suffer more the consequences or just because oil has become the cash cow for the Nigerian state? Yep. The important that is attached to it, which, like uh, Ken's daughter said earlier, was nurtured by his father's activism and the rest of them. Is it because of that that oil has become so strategically important? Or is it just because that's where the money is and everybody wants to have a go at it? And I think as Nigeria progresses, that's one question we must keep asking ourselves. And I think that you know, can Sarah Wewa and Co reinforce the whole values in and around nonviolence and peace education? Yeah, no, and, and that uh, nexus between oil and um, conflict and uh, politics is, is an old one. Of course, Karl Meyer wrote that book called This House Has Fallen. Michael Peel has also written a book on that. And we know from that that, you know, it is a an, an never ending saga. And some of the initiatives that you touched upon, Austin, both the voluntary principles, and we had Bennett Freeman talking to us about it, how they came about, and EITA, with which you were involved, Lidham, uh, they both show that uh, these became necessary because of the situation we were in. No, I want to turn to you. You know, we've been talking about, uh, <laughs> Austin was urging uh, Ladum to write his memoirs. You are a writer and, uh, you know, you've written a travel uh, book about uh, Nigeria, of course, but you also want to write on the Delta. Can you tell us what that is about? And is it going to be about the struggle? Is it going to be about uh, politics? Is it going to be about your own impressions? Yeah, um, so yeah, I, my first book was uh, about my travels around like the whole of Nigeria. Uh, and I went to the Niger Delta at the time, but not you know, in, a, in an in-depth way. So uh, I want this book to be uh, about my travels around the Delta. And it's a, it's a look at you know, my father's legacy and you know, how it's changed, how the Delta has changed, whether it's changed for the better or for the worse. Um, I've already done some of the travels, so uh, you know I visited Bodo, where you had that huge oil spill in 2008, and you know I found that uh, the water was still dirty. It had been cleaned a little bit, but uh, not fully. Uh, the mangroves were, were were dead and still covered in oil. There were fallen trees, uh, <clears throat> you know. So there were areas where you know, I hadn't seen much progress. Uh, I also visited gas flares in um, the Delta State uh, and, you know, I photographed villagers who still dry their cassava uh, next to these huge flames uh, and they're breathing in hydrocarbons every day, all day, every day. And it's, you know, women, it's children, 
as well as men. Um, and, you know, I, I, I found that quite shocking that, uh, you know, 25 years after my father's death, these practices are still going on and the government is doing nothing to alleviate that. But, you know, at the same time, I spoke to former uh, illegal refiners who have now been encouraged to, to move away from that activity and, and to, you know, cultivate rice and, and cassava and, and things like that. So, you know, I just want to paint a portrait of the Niger Delta, the ways in which, uh, you know, my father has, has changed things and, and, and the ways in which things haven't changed. So, you know, it's been, it's been really interesting. It's, uh, it's what I've always wanted to do. Uh, you know, uh, my first book was really sort of leading up to, to this one. And, um, but I also want to portray, uh, well, to, to show people the beauty of the Niger Delta, the potential beauty, you know, because it's, it's so, it's such a, it could be such a wonderful place. You know, you've got rivers, you've got huge forests, you know, full of animals. And these, you know, a lot of the animals that have disappeared, you know, they can come back. Um, we've seen in India where people have cleared beaches of all the rubbish that was choking the, the ecosystem on those beaches. And they found that turtles that uh, had disappeared for 20 years started coming back, you know? And so I, I feel that the same thing can happen in the Niger Delta. And, uh, you know, I spoke to young people, for example, at uh, the, the tech hub that my late brother, Ken Jr. set up as part of the Ken Sarawiwa Foundation. Um, you know, <clears throat> the foundation now helps these uh, young startups, these IT startups. And I spoke to, to, to guys who are really interested in, in dealing with uh, the plastic waste that you get everywhere in the Niger Delta. And, um, you know, they have all sorts of ideas and, you know, they're young, they're ambitious. Google and Facebook are getting on board and, and helping them, uh, you know, with the sort of tech stuff. And, um, you know, so when I speak to, when I spoke to them, I, I, I feel real hope for the, for the Niger Delta. And, um, and so, you know, for me, it was my, my book is, is, is about it's about that it's it's showing how things could potentially, you know, improve and, and, you know, to get people to look at the Niger Delta, not just as a place of conflict, but but as a place of potential natural beauty, you know, we've still got, you know, gorgeous, like exotic birds and I went on boat trips on, on the river and, you know, if people could understand that we could derive such wealth from that you know, we could one day eventually have tourism and, and all sorts, yeah. uh, which would provide a much uh, better, a cleaner living for people. And, can, you know, it can provide much more money than oil. There's this perception, I think, particularly amongst the older generation, you know, like President Buhari, uh, that oil is this great cash cow and that, you know, nothing else can make more money from oil. But, you know, you look at countries like Italy and France, you know, they don't have major oil industries. They make huge amounts of money from tourism. I'm not suggesting that the Niger Delta can do the same, but we, you know, our, I think our leaders need to, um, you know, get away from this idea that it's only things like oil that can make money. Um, you know, there, there are so many ways in which we can diversify the economy. And so, so yeah, my, my book is, you know, it's essentially a travel log. But it's, you know, I, I just want to show people the Delta in, in, in all its facets and, you know, to give people a sense of hope and, you know, different ideas about how we can move forward. You made two very interesting points because that's one is, of course, the whole idea about uh, diversifying the economy, because that's something people have spoken about for a long time. I mean, I've made only a few trips there, but one of the things that... Uh, Many Nigerians tell us that our land is so fertile that you toss seeds and you know fruit sprouts and crops sprout and all that and this um, erosion and this uh, decline of agriculture and other uh, activities is partly because of the easy money that oil provides. So moving away from that is of course you and the other very important takeaway from what you said is the hope that uh, the young seem to be providing. Ledum, do you feel uh, when you talk to the young people in in the Delta now? Um, uh, do you feel this spring of hope, this optimism? Is there a is there a room for that, or are you cautious? Well, just like Austin was saying, my encounter with young people, um, 
has been in just exactly as Austin explained, because you know, he mentioned about the technical committee in the Niger Delta that I headed when the crisis in the Niger Delta was at this height, at this apex. Um, the government then had set up a committee to come out with a roadmap for how to bring about sustainable peace and the resolution of the issues in the Niger Delta. And I chaired that committee. That took me to the creeks, met with the militants, and one after the other, kept saying that, look, you and your colleagues went on the nonviolent mm -hmm. campaign and you were killed. So we are not going to wait to be killed. So they will defend themselves with the arsenal that they have. And what that has brought about is that there is increasingly among the young people far more anger and impatience with the pace of things. Um, I think Austin also mentioned the fact, and, and, and it's a very sad commentary of what is happening today, that people like me can now even tell you that the, even the civilian government is a little bit, I mean, can compare very frequently, if not more than even the, the I mean, even worse than, than the Abacha regime. Because now people are being killed. They are not even given any pretext of some trial. People are being, I mean, I mean impunity is, is even higher um, now than what has happened. And you now have a generation of angry young men and women who feel that they have to take, I mean, their futures into their hands. And if you see the latest protests of NSAS and all that, and people keep saying that they don't have uh, leadership. But I see them with a the leadership. They have, they are led by anger against injustice. And when you have this critical mass of young people who believe that they, the system is not caring for them and they have to do things for themselves, that's some concern. But it can also offer an, offer an opportunity if government were to think, I mean, rationally, because you can use that critical mass of young people in some progressive mode, engage them and see how you can use them as tools for, for, for progressive uh, change in, 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 in society. But unfortunately, the, what we are getting from government reports of how you are now going after those you consider the leaders of that peaceful movement um, to incarcerate some of them, um, to block their accounts, their bank accounts, and all those sort of things, um, is fueling some anger that if you suppress it so much, it can only lead to some implosion. And that is what appears to be the situation. I have always said that it is sad that the peaceful I mean, protest which we led is now being used as an excuse for even violence in some areas because of the government's response. And, and if you go through the last statement of Ken during that tribunal, it, he clearly said that, that he could see that what happens in this trial will send a message for future generations. If yeah. the government chose the peaceful uh, steps which we took, then it will lead to peace. But if they prefer violence, it will lead to that. And almost everything that they have said had been proved right because you are now seeing an increasing uh, 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 rate of violence. And in fact, I think the, 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 the saturation of small arms and ammunition, ammunition in this part of the world now is quite uh, frightening. And, and, and you can therefore see that we are just sitting on the keg of gunpowder. Yeah, no, and the small arms proliferation is a big problem in West Africa. And um, all of us probably know Alex Bynes, who was with Human Rights Watch, and then of course, uh, now he's with Chatham House Africa program. Uh, he had done a lot of work and he was even part, I think a part of an UN experts panel looking at that. So uh, that's genuinely an issue. One of the, you know, talking about uh, the anger uh, reminds me that when I was in the Delta, one of the 
lyrics that I kept being told again and again uh, by people was "Hungry Man is an Angry Man," you know, Bob Marley and all of that. So that very much is has been a kind of a late motif. So Austin, trying to make sense out of this picture, I wanted to come to you and ask you that you still stress the message of nonviolence and peace and peace building and conflict resolution. What gives you the optimism? Well, um, <clears throat> the, the one of the core attributes or one of the core variables in peace building is your ability to listen to the other person and talk to the other person. Now, today, our government and authorities and powers that be say they are looking for who to talk with. But when we reflect on the lives of Ken, he was all over the place. He was never hiding. He had his pipe with him. He was at the airport. They knew his home, both in Port Harcourt and in uh, his village. And nobody was willing to talk to him. And now you say you are looking for people to talk to. Ken made himself available. Ledum is there, a lawyer. They were young people. When this happened 25 years ago, nobody spoke to them. They were never hiding. They didn't carry arms. They didn't fight anybody. They didn't throw stones. 25 years down the line, we're looking for who to talk with. Now, the issue is peace is inevitable. If we have to make progress, if we have to develop Nigeria, we must have the mindset for peace. But that mindset must be a collective one. It must not be an isolated mindset where some people want peace, others don't want. Um, again, I feel sad at my age. The youths were on the road for 10 days. 10 days. Nobody spoke to them. Ken was on the road for more than three, four, five, six years from the time he became very prominent in the Ogoni movement. Nobody also spoke with him. And then what was the result? Ken and Co were killed. The youths were shot at. What kind of nation are we building? Am I optimistic? Yes, because I don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. I have never subscribed to violence, and I will never do that. I will never ask anybody around me to subscribe to violence. That is why I specifically teach nonviolence and peace education. And that is why I've been an advocate. I look less. I just came in. I told you I came in last night from Niger that I was working with a community somewhere in Imo State. There are two indigenous oil companies. And for close to five years, they refused to sign an MOU with these communities. Now, the community has court members all over the place. There's proliferation of arms. But we've been there saying, no, that's not the way. We've been struggling to get the oil company, an indigenous one for that matter, to come sit on the table with the community. Because I believe in peace building. Even if I drop there today, we'll continue that dialogue. We we'll continue to persuade them to say that is the only way out. Mm. You know, yes, can die for it. We may think that, well, it's not worth it anymore, but it's a stain on our conscience, on our morality that this man died. And I used to tell people every time, you know, you see him at the airport, he granted interviews, he did things. He, he didn't hide. And I tell the young people today that are in the struggle. Can you learn something from the quality of leadership? The way he organized the Ogoni movement. What are the things you can learn? Like the daughter said, and I knew it, the man never stopped reading. His weapon was education and the written word. He didn't distribute money to anybody. He didn't share money. Today, people want to share money. Of course, they didn't have money to share and they never shared money. So those are some of the things, when you look at it, you're optimistic that somehow, at some point, peace building will work and Nigeria will be better off for it. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think the international community should do? I mean, of course, familiarize with, with the issues and so on, but what is the responsibility at an individual and collective level that you see outside Nigeria? You see, uh, unfortunately, Salil, I, 
started doing some more in depth studies in international relations. Yeah. And I, I, I'm doing an academic article on green theory of international relations. Yeah. You know, one of the complexities of green theory of international relations is that something like pollution does not have boundary. Mm -hmm. When you pollute the environment, it doesn't have boundary. You can't circumscribe it. Now, in the international community, what has happened is that Nigeria has been seen like a carcass on the roadside where everybody can go take his or her pick. There has not been a consolidated interest in making Nigeria what it ought to be. For one reason or the other, people are interested in the wealth of Nigeria, in its strategic importance, but calling Nigerian powers that be to order in and around these kind of issues, people have been very locked in. And even including the UK itself, that colonized Nigeria. I mean, we've seen the runoff, the election going on in the US. Under President Trump, there was literally no African policy, not to talk of a Nigerian policy. Mm. Okay, so the engagement was not even there. And the president, the, the, President Trump wasn't interested. If you look, we were attending the ECOWAS early warning meeting sometime in 2008. And um, the guy that runs social action in, in, in Port Harcourt there, you know, was talking about, you know, uh, doing a field assessment to Nigeria and, and you, you, you could see the faces of the ECOWAS mm -hmm. members in the room. Nobody could look Nigeria in the face because ECOWAS Secretariat is Nigeria's building. You know, the staff quarters of ECOWAS staff in, in Abuja is owned by the Federal Capital Territory. So people in the international community, they have been very reluctant to look Nigerian leaders in the face and tell them you can do better than you are doing. No. And that's really unfortunate. Yeah, and, and no, turning to you, what do you think uh, can be done from outside? Um, I mean, well, for me, I think, I feel that, you know, our leaders and the people who are responsible for all the corruption, they're too plugged in to the global economy. I think that's part of the problem. They can get their health care from abroad. They can park their money in foreign bank accounts. Rent property. They can buy property. Uh, in Dubai and London, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I know that, you know, in London, they're trying to, uh, you know, they, 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 they created laws where they can question people who have, you know, this unexplained wealth. And, uh, you know, they can prevent people to some extent from, from buying properties uh, in, in England, but that's not really enough. I feel like you need to cut people off at source, you know. Um, uh, and I, I, you know, as Austin was saying, there is this reluctance, uh, you know, for people to do that, but that's what needs to be done. You need to force these people to live with the mess that they create, you know, they shouldn't be allowed to travel abroad, they shouldn't be allowed to tap into the, you know, the global economic, the banking system, um, you know, we have to force them to, to you know, to, to confront. Uh, the chaos and the poverty that they've caused. So, you know, for me, that would be the ideal. You know, it's about naming and shaming. Um, mm -hmm. I can't, I can't, I mean, I just can't think of any other way, but yeah, as Austin was saying, we, you know, we, pre we present an opportunity for people, you know, whether it's strategic, you know, US military strategy and, and whatnot. And so there's always this willingness uh, to appease our political class. Uh, but that really needs to stop because ultimately, you know, Nigeria has such a huge population and, you know, if you have this, you know, as Lydon was saying, a critical mass of disgruntled youth who don't have opportunities, then, you know, those problems get exported um, abroad. Uh, you know, you have a lot of Nigerians wanting to come to Europe, you know, who'd much rather stay in Nigeria, but they, you know, come over to Europe um, desperately in search of a better life. A more stable life and I think you know if Europe really wants to solve this problem you know this huge sort of migration from the global south to the global north then it's you know ultimately in their best interest to uh you know to control our 
the, our leaders, uh, you know, and to deter them from, it's a, to, to make them understand that stealing from uh, the country and then doing nothing to help the country will ultimately, you know, hurt them, the leaders themselves. So, you know, that's what I would like to see. How you get the international community to do that, I don't know, it's the million dollar question, you know, getting people to, to recognize the danger ahead and to, to not be short-sighted in their actions is, you know, a, a, a perennial problem with, with the human race. So, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. We, you know, we have the technology to track who gets the money and what they do with it, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, just some naming and shaming would be, you know, a start. Yeah. No, and, and it's something, and it has to be persisted with. I think that's the key point because, uh, I mean, one of the uh, threshold movements for the international business and human rights community was indeed uh, the Ogoni trial and the aftermath. And that led to more reporting and more, more naming and shaming. And because we are the Institute for Human Rights and Business, no, you have made the strong point about collective action internationally. And often you talked about the need for companies to listen. Ladam, your final thoughts about what do you want companies to do? Well, um, I think maybe in answering the question, maybe I'll just give you a little anecdotal um, mm -hmm. um, recollection. In, in 1993, during the World Conference on Human Rights, um, Ken was prevented from traveling, but I had, I managed to slip through and I traveled to um, Vienna. Um, and had the opportunity of attending a session addressed by Anita Roddick, then the, the, of, of the body shop. Mm -hmm. And she was speaking about the human rights as a business of business. Now, I was taken aback and I said, look, we are here fighting against business that is trampling on human rights, environmental rights, and even everything, even the right to life. And now you are telling us about how business could behave well and in fact promote human rights. That it was something that we could not relate with. And that was what led to our further meeting. And that's how the body shop became involved in the Ogoni case. Why am I referring to that story? At least the body shop came out and through their own actions and activities, showed that we are business, we could do it better. So you shall, you can and should now do better. So you set a model which you thought others should also uh, emulate. So it was not just some human rights groups that were just articulating these issues. You now had business, talking to business, that we are also in business of making money, but at least we can prove, we can do it ethically, we can do it in a better manner. And I think I had expected that over the years, even Shell would be able to now say, look, I think we should evolve, taking the body shops sort of example. Um, but unfortunately, it appears that they saw the thing more as of a public relations thing, that once the story was no longer on the front pages of Western press, then it means it did not exist. And, 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 and I think that is where they, they got it all wrong because it will morph into some other issues from what we have seen now. Uh, and I think that what business needs to do is to take this example of trying to show a model that we can also make money, make profits, but at the same time, make sure that we put the people first, the lives of the people first, their environment first. And that is what I think business ought to do. And they can do that quite easily because they, are, they have several people you can partner with, not necessarily using groups as image from image laundry, which is what most businesses try to do. Um, but in real terms to try to say that, well, we are doing business, but at the same time, we want to do it in a manner that is sustainable um, for the environment. We can do it in a manner that people, not just profits, 
should be the determining factor in whatever we're doing. No, absolutely, these are uh, uh, very important words to bear in mind. And uh, in, you're absolutely right about it being a, a kind of catalyzing moment because it was that experience that prompted some internal changes within Shell. And you know, we talked about Sir Jeffrey Chandler at one point in our earlier conversation. Um, and Amnesty International, both at the UK and at the Dutch section, started a dialogue which led to what were called the human rights principles for companies. And that inevitably led to a flowering of a movement which ultimately led to the UN guiding principles. And it was Human Rights Watch which wrote the Price of Oil report, which focused global attention on, on what oil and um, uh, conflict and human rights can do. So these were the, these were the building blocks, the foundation stones of the modern business and human rights movement. Um, I do have two- but, but let me- Yes. Let, let, me just, let me just say one word because I, when the whole issue of dialogue that led to uh, the principles that the oil commission and others were adopting, one point I kept making is that the Ugodis were not complaining about the principles that Shell has. Mm -hmm. We are complaining about their practices. Practices, absolutely. And, 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 and you see, because they are able, because of their multinational configuration, they know how to put the language in each environment that people can live with and appreciate. If they went to, um, um, say, the UK or the US or anywhere and said, we now have principles. Because it's a society that when you have principles, people expect that you are going to abide by those principles. But when you come here and talk to us about principles, we do not hear you because people are interested in what happens on the ground, mm -hmm. not those principles that are in their books. So there is this gulf of how people perceive what they are doing, which they are playing to the purposes of trying to, 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 to divide support for maybe communities in situations like ours. And the point is that it is not necessarily those principles in their books that they are applying here. What they are applying, I mean, they might have beautiful things written, but their practices here are woeful. And, and that is one critical point that, I mean, we think that needs to be made because I don't, I've never complained about Shell's principles any day. I mm -hmm. complain about their practices. That's what my people see. That's what affects our lives adversely. Uh, no, do you trust companies? Do you trust their principles and their remarks? No, what do you think? No, I mean, you know, even in, in a country like the UK where, uh, you know, governance is stronger and there's more accountability, you see the lengths that uh, the companies go to to, uh, to shaft uh, customers and whatnot. You know, given a, a chance, business will get away with with anything, you know. I mean, my mobile phone company uh, went through a, a stage of just taking 200 pounds out of people's account. And, you know, and it was just theft, <laughs> uh, you know, but we, we have bodies that we can complain to and, and people got their money back. Um, so yeah, you know, if, if, uh, if businesses are slippery in, in places like the UK where the rule of law is relatively strong, then uh, you can be sure that, uh, that they're not following through on a lot of those uh, principles. Uh, in the Niger Delta and, you know, traveling around, uh, you could see that, you know, you, you could see that, uh, that the commitment to change wasn't, you know, wasn't fully there. Uh, you, you know, you see it with your own eyes, but uh, yeah, when, when you don't have as much, um, uh, when the international press isn't following you, you don't have as much exposure Mm -hmm. as you had before, then there is this sense of uh, impunity. Uh, you know, it's, it's, we, we live in a world where unless your uh, country is being shown or the issue is being shown on uh, mainstream TV and in newspapers, uh, it tends to, to, to be you know, ignored or it just slips under the radar. Um, 
So it's, you know, it's very, very difficult. You're constantly competing with big wars elsewhere or elections uh, in the US and, and things like that. And, and you know, uh, big business knows that. Um, our, our government knows that. Um, so, uh, yeah. yeah, you know. They, they're not, that's not to say that the companies haven't done anything. They have been forced to engage in some sort of social responsibility, but it's, it's, it's not, you know, 100%. Yeah, it's never enough. You're absolutely right. Uh, some years ago, when he gave the REACH lectures, Vole Shoinka had this to say about Ogoniland. Ogoniland, alas, only has a model space for the actualization of long-term dreamt totalitarian onslaught on the more liberated, more politically sophisticated sections of the Nigerian polity, which have dared to expose and confront the power obsession of the minuscule but obdurate military civilian hegemony. This has led obviously to you know, Nigeria suffering in the kind of uh, corruption and the transfer of wealth that uh, Noah was talking about. Here's a poem of uh, Ken. Nigeria, you like to borrow, borrow. You borrow money, cloth you day borrow. You borrow motor, you borrow aeroplane. You borrow chop, you borrow drink. So they, you borrow another man language. Begin confuse am with your confusion. Anything you borrow, you go confuse am to nonsense. Idiot debtor, wherein you go? When do owners go? Come to take them things. Uh, not exactly a very rosy scenario, but the optimistic signs are, are there. I mean, you know, Ledham is there still fighting the good fight, keeping an eye and trying to keep and ensuring that those with power are held to account. Austin hasn't given up hope. He's injecting the message of peace and non-violence among the young and making sure that they do not feel that they have to take weapons in their hands. And Noah is writing a new book and in which she's going to talk and she's been talking about the young people, the diversification of the economy. And those are the building blocks on which we have to hope for and anticipate a new Nigeria that is at peace, where again, as we said earlier, uh, when Nimo was talking to us, we concluded that the GDP is not measured by dollars and cents, but the laughter on the faces of the children. Leda Miti, No Saruviva, Austin Onua. Thank you very much and all the best to you and your work. Thank you.